Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I'm going to step outside my wheelhouse a little bit and look at a civil case. And this is a civil case that's ongoing. It looks like documents have just been filed. Things have just started. So these are all allegations. None of this, to my knowledge, has been proven in a court at this point. But these allegations are wild and epic. So I really wanted to cover this one. It's getting a lot of commentary online. And this one is really going to be one where we need a drink. And I'm not going with scotch today because I don't think I'd survive. So let's have a look at this case. So this is the case of Clearwater Commercial Finance Corporation and Trigger Wholesale Incorporated, the Oncadra Group, Mark Gadak, Jamie Lynn Gadak, and JMAC Real Properties. Uh, these documents were apparently posted online on Canadian Gun Nuts. Uh, there are also, they'd be public record because they're filed documents, it looks like. So notice of motion, and this was returnable October 22nd, so this has already happened, and in fact, it looks like an order has been granted with respect to this. So they're asking for a number of things. First, they want to convert an interim receivership order into a full receivership order and appoint Grant Thornton Limited as receiver without security of all the assets, undertakings, and properties of Trigger Wholesale Incorporated, the Oncadra Group, and certain real property owned by each of the JMAC Real Properties Incorporated or Jamie Lynn Gadak, as specified in the draft order attached at tab three. Uh, they want to continue the Mariva injunction relief. And if you don't know what a Mariva injunction is, this is essentially an order to freeze assets. So they don't want any money escaping. They want everything locked down. Authorizing, but not obligating, GTL to file assignments in bankruptcy for each of Trigger and Oncadra under the BIA, so Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. So they want the receiver to be able to declare them bankrupt. Authorizing GTL to act as trustee in bankruptcy for each of Trigger and Oncadra. Authorizing GTL to transfer uh, $30,000 from the national receivership proceedings to GTL in its capacity as proposed trustee in bankruptcy to fund the administration of the proposed bankruptcy proceedings of Trigger. So what we can see is that they anticipate that Trigger is done as a company and that their assets are going to be sold off in bankruptcy. Authorizing GTL to transfer 30 grand from the national receivership proceedings in GTL in its capacity as proposed trustee in bankruptcy to fund the, fund the administration of the proposed bankruptcy proceedings of Oncadra. So same thing, but just with respect to another company. Requiring Brian Kelly to provide information or documents to the receiver to aid in the receiver's efforts to take control of the property and discharge its duties under the national receivership proceedings. Authorizing the receiver to conduct examinations of each of Mark Gadak, Jamie Lynn Gadak, Brian Kelly, Mike Nero, and Phil Searles in respect of the property that pertains to the national receivership proceedings. So they want to be able to ask them questions and get some answers on this because they have all sorts of questions for all sorts of reasons. Granting certain relief ancillary as detailed in the attached draft order included in tab three of the motion record and establishing a timetable for the balance of the steps in this proceedings with respect to the allegations of personal liability against Mark Gadak and Jamie Gadak. So personal liability here is a big deal because normally the purpose of a corporation is to shield yourself from liability. But here they want to not just go after the corporation, but go after the people behind it as well. So they want to go after their assets personally. They're uh, not going to be happy about that, but we'll see why, the, uh, why Clearwater is asking for this. So, and such further and other relief as this honorable court may seem just. That's kind of throwaway language. You put it in everything just to say, if you can think of something that's good for us that we didn't ask for, please give it to us anyway. So the grounds for this motion are, so these are, again, unproven allegations, but they get wild and, if proven, are going to be a real bad scene for the people involved. So let's have a look at what they're saying. And I'll note that some of these allegations are the kind of thing you don't make lightly in the court filing. So... On October 13th, 2020, on the application of Clearflow uh, Commercial Finance Corporation, GTL was appointed as the interim receiver over the assets and undertaking of the respondents, Trigger and Oncadra, pursuant to the interim receivership order granted by the Honorable Madam Justice Gilmore. The interim receivership order also contained terms imposing a Mariva injunction on the remaining respondents. 
So again, freezing their assets, locking everything down so they can't sell it, they can't move it, etc. Which is, again, going to be a big step. So we can see that they're already making big moves here. The request for interim relief became necessary as a result of recently discovered evidence of a massive, long-standing, organized pattern of fraud that has come to the attention of ClearFlow very recently based on multiple instances of clear and convincing evidence from different and independent sources. The dollar amounts involved in the fraud could potentially total in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, let's talk about something that comes up in civil law, which is alleging fraud is not something you do lightly. The reason why is that if you allege that somebody has engaged in fraud, as opposed to just screwing up somehow, making a mistake, making an error, being negligent, but when you go so far as to say fraud, it potentially, if you can't back that up, if you can't convince the court that fraud was actually at play, the court may punish you for that. They may punish you for that in various costs or other potential sanctions. So fraud is something, it's not a trigger you want to pull lightly. So I'm guessing they might have something to back this up, but I can't say for certain. It could be that they're making a terrible mistake here, but they're not coming out gentle here. They're coming out swinging hard for the fences. The evidence of fraud on the part of the respondents set out in the affidavit sworn in support of the interim receivership application included evidence of forgery, alteration of documents, and fabrication of false documents. Again, these are huge allegations. It was not only possible, but likely that the respondents would destroy or alter evidence, remove assets from the jurisdiction, and conceal the existence of assets during the 10-day period after service of the required notices of intention to enforce security pursuant to Section 244 of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. So they're saying that uh, because of the frauds going on, we have to lock everything down right away to keep them from hiding money because we're, you know, they're alleging that these people are real shady. So that's the allegations here. Again, big allegations. Clearflow is a federally incorporated Canadian company that has been in business for the past six years of providing financing to medium-sized businesses in Ontario, typically through factoring of accounts receivable, although Clearflow occasionally extends other types of credit facilities to its customers in addition to factoring of accounts receivable. Trigger is one of Clearflow's customers pursuant to three separate credit facilities. The total amount owed by Trigger in favor of Clearflow was, as of October 6th, $48,600,000 and change at that point. Because once you say $48,600,000, everything after that is and change. That's more money than I anticipate seeing in my lifetime. That's, that's a lot of cash. So let's see how we get there. Trigger is an Ontario incorporated company that is allegedly in the business of in, importing and distributing firearms, particularly shotguns and associated ammunition to customers throughout Canada. Trigger's customers allegedly include small gun shops, the military, police forces, and large retailers, specifically Canadian Tire and Home Hardware. So if the military and police forces have an interest in this because suddenly somebody who's providing things to them and where they might have ongoing contracts is getting wound up because of a massive fraud, I imagine they'll take an interest. If there's actually evidence to support all of this, we may see criminal proceedings, not just civil ones. So again, I don't know what evidence there is, but these are, this is huge. Uh, it's not normal that we have such massive scandals in the Canadian sort of business world, and especially in the Canadian firearm business world. So the respondents, Ankadra, Gadak, and Jamie, have each executed continuing and unlimited guarantees of the indebtedness of Trigger in favor of Clearflow. Clearflow holds security against all the personal property and assets of Trigger and Ankadra in the form of separate general security agreements over each company, each of which specifically contemplates the appointment of a receiver in the event of default. So essentially saying that Clearflow has agreements that if Trigger can't pay them, they can come in and start taking their stuff. 
The respondents, Jamie and Jay Mack, own certain real property located in Waterloo, Ontario, and in Huron County, Ontario. There is good reason to believe that title to these properties was placed in the names of Jamie or Jay Mack in an effort to shield assets from the reach of Clearflow and other creditors in the event that the fraudulent scheme was discovered. In any event, at this time, these properties may be an important source of recovery for Clearflow. Jamie, who it, whom it is submitted the evidence suggests, is aware of and involved in the fraud, is the sole director of JMAC or the direct owner of these properties. So again, not just alleging fraud, but alleging that they're hiding assets because they would have known that the fraud would eventually be discovered and they want to protect these assets from clear flow. So this is not just alleging sort of a casual fraud. This is alleging a real ongoing planned out fraud, which, you know, when they're saying hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't get to hundreds of millions of dollars by, you know, by convenient or by sort of a small screw up usually. So Gadak and Jamie are both directors of Trigger. Jamie has been actively involved in Trigger's business and has served in a senior accounts receivable collection capacity. The fraud perpetrated in this case specifically relates to falsification of accounts receivable, including invoices, making it likely that Jamie was at all material times aware of and participated in the fraudulent action described below. Jamie is the sole officer and director of JMAC. Upon its appointment as the interim receiver, the interim receiver commenced an investigation into the business and affairs of Clearflow. The results of those investigations have confirmed Clearflow's allegation of a massive and premeditated fraud on the parts of respondents and, in fact, have unearthed additional fraudulent actions, including forgery of government-issued firearms inspection documents. Wow, <laughs> like that is huge. So again, Clearflow is not coming out lightly, and these are the kinds of allegations that typically typically aren't made lightly. So we'll have to see what's going on. This is going to be a case to follow. I am blown away by what I'm seeing here in, again, nothing here that I can see is proven, but these are huge allegations. Accordingly, Clearflow is applying for the conversion of the interim receivership into a full receivership appointment pursuant to Section 243 of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act for the continuation of the Mariva injunction and for certain other relief. Since the issuance of the interim receivership order, written demands for repayment, the notice of intention to enforce security, have now been delivered to Trigger and its guarantors. The demands and the notice of intention indicate to the court the nature of the events of default on the part of Trigger that give rise to the demands, as well as the total indebtedness owed by Trigger in favor of Clearflow, which as stated above is nearly $50 million. The fraud is summarized in detail in the first report of the interim receiver filed in respect to this motion and consists of of the 22,149 invoices factored by Clearflow since the inception of the relationship with Trigger, it appears that the large majority of these invoices were falsified. <laughs> Whoa! The large majority of 22,000. That's... I'm sure that when Clearflow discovered this, assuming, you know, that what they're saying is accurate and again, unproven at this stage, but that's got to have really woken some people up in the morning. <laughs> that's got to have been a major thing. That's, that's just, that's huge allegations. Multiple falsified purchase orders provided to Clearflow as further evidence that Trigger was doing business with Canadian Tire and Home Hardware when in fact either Trigger was doing no business at all with these retailers or was doing a much smaller volume of business with them than the falsified purchase orders would suggest. So what they're alleging here is basically that they invented a business relationship with Canadian Tire and Home Hardware uh, or they inflated it such that they could show that they were getting a whole bunch of profit and doing a whole bunch of business in order to continue being loaned money, which they then, you know, if this is false business, they're not using it for actually, you know, providing services. So again, wow. A forged transfer of real property provided to Clearflow by Gadak on behalf of Oncadra, designed to make it look like Oncadra owns real property located in Waterloo, Ontario, with an alleged value of $48 million, 
when in fact Ankadra does not hold any interest in the said property. So the allegation here is that they're pretending they own a bunch of land that they don't own. <laughs> Whoa. Fake email addresses provided to Clearflow by Gadak purporting to be the email addresses of executives at Canadian Tire and Home Hardware, which email addresses are in fact not email addresses of Canadian Tire or Home Hardware employees. So again, they're not saying that this was a, you know, a screw up. They're saying this was a serious scheme. A falsified real property agreement of purchase and sale showing non-existent corporations as purchasers provided to Clearflow as evidence that Oncadra is in the process of selling the property denoted above, which it does not own, and the real owners of which are unconnected to Oncadra for a purchase price of $48 million. So probably here saying, we've got your money, we're going to have it real soon, we're just selling some land, and as soon as that's sold to these people who totally exist and are totally buying it, then we'll be square. <laughs> this... Yeah, assuming all of this ends up being backed up, I'd expect criminal charges if this is accurate, and this is huge. Verbal and email impersonations of executives employed by Canadian Tire and home hardware stores in connection with the phony email addresses. Hello, yes, I'm totally a Canadian Tire CEO or whatever. This, there's a lot going on in this one. Forged checks made to look like payments by Canadian Tire and Home Hardware to trigger for firearms allegedly purchased by and delivered to multiple locations of each of these retailers. I don't know, does Home Hardware even sell guns? I know some Canadian Tires do, but does Home Hardware sell guns? Let me know in the comments if you've ever bought a gun from Home Hardware, uh, other than like a nail gun, because I know they sell those. A forged inspection letter allegedly issued by the Office of the Chief Firearms Officer of Ontario, which is the provincial agency that regulates, inspects, and monitor the, monitors the storage of firearms by wholesalers and distributors in Ontario. So they're not just forging real property agreements, allegedly here. They're, uh, their claim is that they're also forging CFO documents, which are, you know, government documents and fairly serious business because they kind of take the chief firearms officer as fairly important and they get pretty snarky if they think that they're forging documents there. The evidence supports the conclusion that the fraud has been orchestrated in an effort to induce Clearflow to advance tens of millions of dollars to trigger, which it has done in good faith reliance on the truthfulness of the representations made and documentation supplied by the respondents. The nature and extent of the fraud is such that anyone in a management position to trigger must have been at least aware of the fraud. And I bet Clearflow really regrets advancing that tens of millions of dollars to trigger, but it sounds like there was a lot of effort made to, to keep all this going. So at least that's what Clearflow is alleging is this big giant scheme. It is just inconvenient that the receiver be appointed on the terms requested herein. It is further just inconvenient that the receiver be appointed as receiver over certain real property owned by some of the respondents with the property to mark or with the power to market and sell such property. It is further just and convenient that the Mariva injunction terms be continued according to the terms of the draft order and submitted to this honorable court. Such further and other grounds as the lawyers for Clearflow and the interim receiver may advise, and they note that they will be tendering some documentary evidence at the hearing. So the first report to the court of the interim receiver dated October 21st, 2020, and the appendices thereto, and such further and other evidence as the lawyers may advise and the honorable court may permit. So again, wow, this is one heck of a, a filing here, because if all of this turns out to be made out, I mean, Clearflow, I hope they've got assets to survive a, you know, nearly $50 million hit. That's a lot of money. And, you know, a lot of companies would suffer from that. But this, if all of the allegations are made out, I will expect some people to be going to jail over this one. Not just, you know, not just losing everything because Clearflow is trying to come after their assets personally. Uh, but also I expect just complete flatlining essentially 
sort of crushing everything they've got and sending them to custody if the allegations are proven. So this is this is a heck of a document to start out with. We'll have to see what ultimately is proven in court, but wow, this is a major, major thing for the Canadian firearms industry in Canada. And I'm sure that there's probably a number of people who are going to be affected by this. So let's continue and have a look at what all is going on here because there's some further evidence that they've tendered. And this one's going to be just grab a drink and follow along. This one's going to be a wild ride. So this is the first report of the interim receiver dated October 21st, 2020. And it's going to be interesting. So introduction. Grant Thornton Limited was appointed as interim receiver of Trigger Wholesale Incorporated and the Encadra Group, uh, collectively the debtors, by order of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, dated October 13th, 2020. Copies of the interim receivership order and the endorsements of the Honorable Madam Justice Gilmore are attached hereto as Appendix 1. Background information pertaining to the debtors, including the circumstances leading to the appointment of the interim receiver, are contained in the affidavits of Martin Rees, Sandy Canisius, and Glenn Peterson, each sworn October 9th. The Clearflow affidavits in support of Clearflow Commercial Financial Corporation's application to the appointment of the interim receiver. A copy of the Clearflow affidavits without appendices is attached as Appendix 2 and are accessible on the website. Uh, Clearflow is the primary secured creditor of the debtors. The debtors are both companies that are incorporated on, in Ontario and are allegedly in the business of importing and distributing firearms, particularly shotguns, and associated ammunition to customers throughout Canada. The debtors' customers allegedly include Canadian Tire and Home Hardware, as well as small gun shops, outdoor stores, the military, and police forces. The registered address, and they give the address, and the directors of Trigger are Mark Gadak, Jamie Lynn Gadak, and Brian Richard Kelly. Although the interim receiver understands that recently Mr. Kelly has resigned as a director of Trigger. Okay. The interim receiver does not have any knowledge at this time as to the precise nature of the business that Ancadra was engaged in prior to the granting of the interim receivership order. That's kind of concerning. You'd think normally a business would be involved in some sort of readily ascertainable business, but apparently they don't know what it is and they're the interim receiver. The debtor's assets con consist of a accounts receivable due and owing from customers of the debtor, Firearms and ammunition inventory owned by the debtors and stored in a secure facility located at 588 Colby Drive, Suite 1, Waterloo, Ontario, the premises. I'd feel bad about listing that address, except, again, these would all be publicly filed documents, so... Yeah. Miscellaneous assets, including office equipment and computers. Goodwill! <laughs> okay, drink to the value of the goodwill. And customer lists. I don't imagine that goodwill is going to buy much if all of these allegations are made out. But I guess it's worth something. Maybe they can, you know, get a latte with it. But um, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the firearms and ammunition inventory. I imagine that if they have all these orders on the go, it'll be sold off to satisfy those orders for the original terms. But maybe some of it will end up at auction. Maybe there'll be an opportunity for somebody to pick up a, a cheap shotgun. So disclaimer, in preparing the, this report, the interim receiver has reviewed certain unaudited financial information and certain financial information related to the debtors. While the interim receiver has performed a preliminary review of available books and records of the debtors, such review does not constitute an audit or verification of such information for accuracy, completeness, or compliance with generally accepted auditing standards or international financial reporting standards. Accordingly, the interim receiver expresses no opinion or other form of assurance pursuant to those things with respect to such information. Gee, I wonder, is there a reason why we might want those books audited here? Yeah. This report has been prepared for the use of this court as general information to assist the court in making a determination of whether to approve the release sought by Clearflow in respect of motion that is scheduled to be heard on October 22nd, so will have already been heard. Accordingly, the reader is cautioned that this report may not be appropriate for any other purpose. However, it is hilarious for any other purpose. All references to dollars are Canadian currency unless otherwise noticed. 
Purpose of first report is to advise the court on the interim receiver's activities since its appointment and provide information pertaining to Clearflow's request for an order, uh, asking to convert the interim receivership into a full receivership, continuing the injunction, and all the things that we have already covered in the last bit. So taking possession. Prior to the interim receiver's appointment, Clearflow Management advised GTL that the premises contained a large number of non-restricted, restricted, and prohibited firearms, as well as ammunition, and that the principal of Trigger, Mr. Gadak, had a permit to carry a concealed firearm. Huh, that's interesting. Do you know how many people in Canada have a permit to carry a concealed firearm? Just about nobody. So I'm really curious about that. So, in anticipation of being appointed as interim receiver, GTL contacted the Chief Firearms Office for Ontario, the CFO, to inquire if it was possible for a civilian to have a permit to carry a concealed firearm. The CFO advised that while such permits were very rarely granted, they did exist. And by very rarely, it's almost unheard of. I think that when there was the last Freedom of Information request, there was something like two in Canada, and one here that's really unusual so i don't know what's going on here let's uh let's go on and find out upon its appointment the interim receiver attended at the waterloo police north division station and sought assistance from the waterloo police department in gaining entry to the premises due to the premises containing firearms and ammunition there was no one present at the premises when the interim receiver arrived at approximately 6 p.m therefore they called mr gadak informed him of the appointment of the interim receiver and asked the attend the premises to allow the interim receiver to take possession thereof. He cooperated and attended at the premises, provided them with the keys, as well as the passcodes to the alarm system, names of the security monitoring company and information technology consultant uh, used by the debtors, and he also provided them with a tour of the premises prior to departing after he advised that he was not prepared to answer any additional questions without speaking to his counsel. Smart! I approve of this! keeping his mouth shut that is exactly what people should do when they are in this kind of trouble according to the allegations here even if you're not in trouble if there's people asking you questions that put could put you at legal risk or suggesting that especially if those people are police officers but not limited to shut up get a lawyer so i gotta give him props for this that was that's a good move so, Mr. Gadak agreed to meet uh, at the premises at 9.30 a.m. the next day in order to assist them with fulfilling its duties. The CFO has advised that pursuant to Section 91 of the Criminal Code, anyone with access to non-restricted firearms must hold either a non-restricted uh, possession and acquisition license or be under the direct and immediate supervision of somebody who does, or if they have a restricted, they need an RPAL, and here they list that there's criminal offenses. The IR's representative responsible for taking possession of the premises holds the appropriate licenses to possess restricted and non-restricted firearms and provides direct and immediate supervision of anyone that entered the warehouse at the premises where the firearms are stored in accordance with section 91 sub 4 sub A. It's kind of an... I'm not sure how much direct and immediate supervision they could provide if there was lots of people there, but I guess they're saying, hey, we're complying with the criminal law, which is always a good thing to say if you're submitting a document to the court you don't want to say hey um we also committed a whole bunch of crimes at the time so and i'm sure that they were making their best effort to follow the law i just don't know the specifics and the direct and immediate supervision is kind of a term that's not very well defined so who knows so the interim receiver has also confirmed with the CFO that since they've come into the possession of the firearms as a result of the interim receivership order, the exception provided in section 91 sub 4 sub B applies. I'll just stop here and explain what this means. So there's a subsection that provides you with an exception to the normal requirement to have a license and so forth, where you come into possession of firearms through operation of law. Now, this is usually the inheritance exception. That's usually the context where people encounter this. You know, somebody dies, you inherit firearms, the executor's got to take possession of them, you might be able to, you know, there's exceptions provided in that fashion. So here, uh, the operation of law isn't applying because somebody died, it's applying because a company is potentially being wound up and this company, this other company is stepping in. So, cool. 
that's kind of a neat firearm aspect to this file. The interim receiver has arranged for a security consultant, locksmith, security camera consultant, and IT consultant to attend the premises and proceeded to take possession of the premises, which included changing the locks, reviewing the internal security of firearms and ammunition, reviewing the setup of security cameras, and reviewing the IT setup, backing up email and accounting data, and disconnecting remote access to the debtor's computer, computer server. This is a sensible plan because you don't want to leave remote access open because then somebody might log in and wipe drives, which you don't want. Uh, and, you know, there's you don't need to suspect that somebody's going to do that specifically, but it's just good precaution. Similarly, if the police are seizing electronics, they'll try to make sure that nobody can log into them remotely and destroy things. Because, again, if you need that information, you take those steps. So the interim receiver was unable to make arrangements to change access to the alarm system on October 13th. Therefore, a security guard was posted with instructions not to allow anyone to enter the premises other than the receiver and its consultants. At approximately 9 a.m. on October 14th, Mr. Gadak called them and advised he would be unable to attend the premises to assist as he'd be meeting with counsel. Again, really good idea. Meet with a lawyer. They requested that he provide usernames and passwords to the accounting software so that an inventory and listing uh, accounts receivable listing could be obtained. He said that he couldn't remember them and would provide them later in the day along with the inventory and listings. On October 14th, they spoke with Waterloo Networking Company, which managed the debtor's IT and arranged for only uh, them to have access to Trigger's physical and virtual servers. They also spoke with the Summit Group, which holds Trigger's QuickBooks, and arrange for only the interim receiver to have access to QuickBooks. They're being very thorough here. I got to commend them for how they're going about this. And I'm sure that, you know, this is what they do. So this is not new to them, but good work. I approve of, you know, the steps they're taking here. It makes the, seems to make a whole lot of sense. In addition, on its appointment, they notified Bank of Montreal where the debtors hold certain bank accounts to freeze the existing ass accounts for withdrawals and make them for deposit only. At the time, there was approximately 16,000 in aggregate in the bank accounts, which is a lot less than 48 million. <laughs> in parallel with this, they opened new trust accounts for Trigger and Oncadra as required by the interim receivership order. Uh, they've also confirmed that insurance is currently in place. However, the policy was renewed in June 2020 and no premiums have been paid. Premium arrears are currently $71,668 and are $14,343 per month going forward. They're investigating other more economical insurance options. So the interim receiver thinks that they were overpaying for insurance, which is among the least of the allegations going on here. As required by the interim receivership order, the interim receiver set up and is maintaining a case website containing all publicly available information in these proceedings, which we're gonna appreciate. I'm just going to say thank you. That's that's wonderful. Assets. Accounts receivable. Clearflow advises that it is currently factored triggers outstanding accounts receivable totaling 64 million and change and provided them with a listing of this accounts receivable. A copy of the Clearflow accounts receivable listing is attached here as Appendix 3. Now again, we've already heard that this accounts receivable might have some problems with it. So we'll have to see. The interim receiver has access triggers QuickBooks records and was able to print a report detailing amounts outstanding from customers. Uh, the this uh, details amounts owing from customers totaling totaling one and a half million. And they've got an appendix four for that. They asked Mr. Gadak to confirm that the accounts receivable listing was correct, to which he provided an alternative accounts receivable listing totaling one million four hundred thousand of which 400,607 or yeah 467,000 rather represents inventory held at customers on consignment and based on the typical terms of consignment has likely not been sold to the customer the actual amount owing from customers according to Mr. Gadak is therefore 944,000 copy of the Mr. Gadak accounts receivable listing is attached as appendix 5 so we note that there's a substantial difference between the 64 million that Clearflow was expecting to see on the accounts receivable and the 
one and a half million, which then gets cut down to one million that Mr. Gadak provides. That's a lot of difference in those two numbers. On October 19th, the infirm receiver asked Mr. Gadak if any of the accounts receivable on the account on the clear flow uh, listing were collectible, to which Mr. Gadak replied that triggers only accounts receivable are those listed on the Mr. Gadak accounts receivable listing. Based on the initial findings, it is concerned that all of the invoices factored by Clearflow totaling $64 million may not be real, but further investigation is required with respect to this matter. You know, I'm sure that there's people at Clearflow who are having a drink right now about this same issue. Inventory, or the, uh, they're in the process of contacting all customers and requesting that they verify the account, the amounts owing to Trigger. <laughs> and I'm sure that a lot of the comments that come back are going to be, man, what? So inventory, well, assuming that these allegations are made out, but this appears to be from the report of the interim receiver. So I assume that they're not lying to the court here, but I don't know for sure. Again, not proven in court yet. This is just a report. Clearflow advised the uh, September 28th, 2020, Trigger told Clearflow that the inventory at the premises had a cost value of approximately $6 million. That's a lot of guns and ammo. I, I have a bunch of guns, but it's not $6 million worth by any stretch. While there were firearms and ammunition at the premises, it was apparent to the interim receiver, based on the quantity on site, that the value was significantly less than six million. They opened numerous boxes of handguns, which were restricted firearms, and noted that they were all in disrepair and rusted. These firearms are unusable in their current condition and have very little value. Oh, that hurts. Moment of silence for the, uh, the ruined handguns. The interim receiver also opened numerous boxes of rifles, which are non-restricted firearms, and noted that they appeared to be in new condition. Well, I guess that's a relief. Mr. Gadak emailed the uh, interim receiver an inventory listing, which states that the cost value of the inventory at the premises is $2 million, and this appears to be prepared in Excel rather than a printout from QuickBooks. And at this point, I don't think that the interim receiver here is going to be too forgiving of like accounting or bookkeeping inconsistencies. I suspect that this is the sort of thing where they're saying we have some red flags that we'd like to look into. A copy of the inventory listing is attached as Appendix 6. They've not been able to generate a similar listing in QuickBooks, so they may not have maintained its inventory records in QuickBooks. Preliminary findings to support Clearflow's concerns. Discussion with Mr. Gadak. On October 19th, they got a call in which he advised that he was preparing to plan to or preparing a plan to repay part of the funds advanced by Clearflow. This plan included handing over five properties with equity of approximately seven million, two of which were under contract to be sold. Clearflow is aware of the following five properties uh, that are owned by either JMac or Ms. Gadak, and they list addresses. Uh, they believe that he was referring to those five properties. CFO audit letter. Uh, they contacted the CFO and requested that an inventory audit be completed to ensure that all re restricted firearms registered to trigger are located at the promise or at the premises. Uh, they've acknowledged the request and will conduct an audit as soon as possible. They advised that the last audit was completed December 19th, 2020 or December 2019. Clearflow has provided uh, copies of the CFO audit letters it obtained from Trigger dated March 5th and Mar May 11th. Uh, they provided these letters to the CFO, who's advised that while a letter dated March 5th was issued to Trigger in respect to the December 2019 audit, the letter provided by Clearflow has been substantially altered. Holy shit! <laughs> from the original letter issued by the CFO. Examples of alternations, I, I can't criticize, I'm tired, I've been tripping over my own words here, but alterations include changing the number of restricted firearms located at the premises from 1,114 to 31,114. This seems like a kid, you know, messing with their homework. 
oh, I'll just turn this D into a C by erasing a little bit here or maybe changing it into a B. They just add it like they're saying that they just added a three here. Wow. The number of self-audited items from 200 to 3,000 and the number of CFO audited items from 162 to 3,162. I guess they like adding a three. That's what they're suggesting here. Changing the number of reported cameras on the premises from 16 to 32. I don't even know why that would be a thing you'd do. Changing the number of motion sensors in the warehouse from 11 to 14. Removing a sentence that advised the panic alarms were not in use at the time of inspection. Stating that an audit of the trigger service uh, ledge was completed finding no issues to report when there is no mention of such an audit in the original letter. And adding a statement that this is the 24th inspection without issue and continuous advancements in security and operations when there is no such statement in the original letter. The CFO also advised that the letter dated May 11th was not issued by the CFO and the audit referred to therein never occurred. Copies of the letters provided to Clearflow by Trigger and the actual letters provided to the Trigger by the CFO are attached as appendices 7 and 8 respectively. Wow! <laughs> that, I mean, what they're suggesting here is some truly audacious conduct. So, again, if all of this is proven... This is epic. Customer email accounts. They state the trigger created fake email addresses for supposed Canadian tire and home hardware employees. This is fantastic. Let's find out about this. Which trigger used to provide false sales and accounts receivable information to Clearflow? They located emails from Phil Searles, Mr. Seal, uh, Searles. I guess that's my best guess at the pronunciation. A trigger employee requesting that the following new domains be created on August uh, 12th and 13th. And those domains are hhdist at on.ca and cdntops.com. Okay, um, this... So they've got some, uh, some receipts here on this. The receiver also located emails from uh, Mr. Searles and Mr. Gadak, uh, dated requesting that the following email addresses be urgently created. Matt McGuire at cdntops.com, C. Shulist at hhdist.ca, and r.egan at hhdist.ca. I like here that they, you know, that these email addresses sort of follow a corporate style, but they use different corporate styles for the different companies. Is the suggestion here? Well, I mean, it looks like they have this in uh, the receiver found these. So I guess that's more substantial here than just an allegation in a filing. Wow, <laughs> this is some some effort. So copies of those emails are attached and an excerpt from one of the emails is provided below. And new domain, a new email user request. Uh, Matthew McGuire, Matt McGuire at cdntops.com. Uh, they also located two laptop computers in Mr. Gadak and his spouse's Jamie's office. These computers were logged into the email accounts for regan.hh.dis.ca uh, and Matt McGuire at cdntops.com. Print screens of these two email account pages are Appendix 10. It would appear Mr. Gadak and or Ms. Gadak were using these computers to impersonate Canadian Tire and Home Hardware employees. Okay, checks located on site. They located 27 uncashed checks from what appear to be trigger customers, uh, totaling, si wow, $1.6 million, the uncashed checks. And so we don't really need to cover the specifics there other than the fact that their home hardware building center the uncashed checks were all drawn on accounts from either Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, Bank of Nova Scotia, or Royal Bank of Canada. It appears that all checks drawn on accounts from each financial institution use the exact same background and same font. Okay. Uh, they also located boxes of paper printed with the exact same check stock for each of CIBC, Bank of Nova Scotia, and Royal Bank of Canada. The check stock paper was located in the office of Mr. Gadak and Ms. Gadak. 
Clearflow has advised that in early August 2020, it requested the trigger to provide scanned copies of checks it was depositing into the Clearflow blocked account at BMO. While five of the uncashed checks are dated in July 2019, the remaining 22 checks are dated in August 2020. Therefore, it appears that Trigger created checks in the name of certain customers to provide to Clearflow in support of deposits it was making to the blocked account. <laughs> so, it just keeps going here. Every time you think, hey, this has got to be you know, enough, nope, there's a new level to this. So, they continue to investigate the true source of funds being deposited into the blocked accounts. So... QuickBooks maintains a log of all entries made by each user. They've reviewed this audit history, which shows that entries for what appear to be false sales were made, lar made largely by Mr. Searles. Numerous accounts for receivable collections were recorded by Mrs. Gadak. It therefore appears that both Miss, uh, Mr. Searles and Mrs. Gadak may have participated in manipulating the accounting records. So summary and recommendation. The preliminary investigation conducted by the uh, interim receiver has revealed the triggers management, specifically Mr. Gadak, Mrs. Gadak, and Mr. Searles, appears to have been involved in the following activity. Entering false customer sales and payments in triggers accounting records, creating email accounts to impersonate Canadian Tire and Home Hardware employees, providing false customer checks on false CIBC, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia, and RBC accounts, and providing same to Clearflow as evidence of customer payments, providing false accounts receivable information to Clearflow and falsifying letters from the CFO and providing such falsified letters to Clearflow. They are of the view that in order to understand what happened to Clearflow's advances and the use of those funds, a more extensive investigation will be required, including, but not limited to, a full review of the debtor's banking activity and reconciliation of customer balances. So I suspect that there's going to be a need for a full forensic audit, which is... A massive process. Okay, so that's the report from Grant Thornton Limited. Hmm. So I'm going to cut things off here and just call this part one of review because there's actually 358 pages. And so if I go through all of the juicy bits in one video, it's going to be like a six hour watch and nobody's got time for that. And frankly, my liver will die so this is going to be a big scandal um, however this shakes out because if all of these allegations don't turn out to be true if this turns out to be an unproven and you know unverified and unsupportable set of allegations then that's going to be epic because they are not making light allegations here. These are really serious sorts of allegations going on. And if they do turn out to be true, well, um, I will expect that some people will be staying at Her Majesty's Hotel, which I'm told the accommodations there are not really to anyone's liking. <laughs> Wow, I am blown away by what I see here because normally civil suits sort of make strong allegations, but not usually this strong. Like this is very heavy in terms of the allegations being made. So I'm really curious to see this. I'm going to do a follow-up video to cover some more of the stuff here because... I haven't been able to cover some of the allegations that are contained in the affidavits and are only summarized, but man, this is, this is big. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. I hope that this has been entertaining and educational. I'm still just blown away by this one. We'll see, but uh, this is a huge set of allegations. I'm just astounded to see it to be honest so i want to thank uh 50 patreon supporters george and demo uh 30 patreon supporter steve browning as well as all the 10 dollars patreon supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following let me know what you think let me know if you're <sighs> yeah i i have no words this is one of those things where normally Normally, I think I'm fairly quick on my feet and can sort of respond to things and, you know, maybe even have some humor, but 
I, I just don't know what to say about this one. It is so huge and it's going to just rock the community, I think. I feel bad for everyone that this is going to affect. I feel bad for Clearflow. And it takes a lot for me to feel bad for a banker. <sighs> anyway, uh, let me know if you want me to do a follow-up and cover more on this one. But, yeah, this may well be the end for uh, Trigger Wholesale. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. And... Have a good evening. Until next time.